I'll give you my foolproof, bulletproof, premium prestige exclusive framework for how to decide whether to say yes or whether to say no. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. This is Jessica, head of coaching strategy at Crisp, and today we're flipping the script for another special edition episode to get Michael's take on the difference between empowering your team and enabling your team, why leaders cannot and should not be accessible to everyone, and why saying no is about liberation, not limitation. Sometimes no means not right now. Sometimes no means no in Q2 and yes in Q3. But sometimes no means no. Just straight up, we're not going to do it. You don't understand. How could this be? Well, context is important. So you can provide some context as to why and someone can understand that. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. And we're back. What's this? What is this episode? What is this show, Jessica? This is the AMMA Ask Michael Mogul Anything. How can they ask me anything? They can send you a text message. Yep. 404-531-7691. You guys submit your questions. We might just answer them on the show. Be amazed how many questions we receive. Now we've got thousands at this point. So obviously we can't answer every single one, but we try to pick the ones that are going to be the most relevant and valuable for people. We try to group them up and we start doing more of these so we can answer more questions. So if you're just jumping in to an AMMA, well, you're in for a treat. And if you haven't listened to other episodes in the podcast, we've got our traditional interview format. We bring in guests from the legal industry and beyond. And then we've also got our encore editions where we bring back some of our most popular episodes. But this is the AMMA. Every time we jump into one of these, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I don't even know what the questions are. I don't want to know until, you know, of course, until you ask them. And then whatever the answer is, these are my thoughts. That's not the gospel. It's, you know, you don't necessarily have to agree. It is my perspective. And if you want somebody else's perspective, then you could ask them. That sounds right. I picked a theme this week that is really popular with our two children. It's around saying no. Oh, good. Okay. (laughs) But from a different angle, of course. So first one, I am trying to build more trust with my team members and have encouraged them to come to me with questions or ideas, making myself more available. While that's had a lot of positive impact on morale, it's been disruptive to my focus and deep work time. How do you balance the need to be accessible and approachable while also having time to do your own work? Yeah, so this is common in any growing business that people always want to ask if you've got a minute. You got a minute? Got a minute? Those minutes add up. Those minutes add up. Sometimes it's just, oh, this will just take two minutes and this will just take five minutes. But before you know it, it's 6, 7 p.m. and you haven't done shit. So... Do you have a minute for this answer that I'm about to give you? Which might A minute be, or like five or six minutes? It might be more than a minute. So at the end of the day with this stuff, we have to realize that we as leaders, we can either empower our team or we can enable our team. And when you are constantly there for the God of minutes, I don't know that you're doing a whole lot of empowerment. Now, somebody may listen to this, someone from your team, and start to pout and say, well, how am I supposed to get my job done if they can't answer my questions? Well, there's this website on the internet that they might be familiar with called Google. They can ask anything. You can ask ChatGPT. You can ask all sorts of questions. Google and ChatGPT always have a minute. But in all sincerity, here's the reality. Yes, you want to be available to your team and you want to be accessible. At the same time, someone's got to run the organization and lead the business and you've got to be able to work on the business. So what I found in my experience, I did this a few years back with the God of Minutes. I mean, it was constantly distracting me, the amount of time it takes to go from distracted to back in focus. And if you're doing this throughout the day, it's just the recipe for disaster. So what you can do is you could set up what are called office hours. So for example, let's say every day between 4 and 5 p.m., you tell people, look, I got a minute. In fact, I got an hour. And 
If you got any questions whatsoever, I'll make that time available to anyone. But here's what I found when I started doing that. Nobody ever used those office hours. I mean, I did this for like two years. It was puzzling. I was like, man, I made all this time available, yet nobody comes in. And it's because the problems would get solved by then. So that got a minute that happened at 8.30 in the morning would be solved. They'd figure it out because otherwise they'd have to wait till 4 or 5 p.m. to get that answer. Do you see what I mean in terms of empowerment or enablement? So I think making sure that you have dedicated time available because someone might take advantage of it, you know, which is in a good way. But at the same time, you don't make yourself accessible 24-7, 365 because you're not their assistant and you're not Google and you're not ChatGPT for them. So, you know, and then you can get to the root of like, why are they asking all these questions? They don't know how to do their job. Is it a function of training and development? Do we onboard them properly, et cetera? Maybe, you know, I don't know. Could be, maybe. But the most important thing is you have to set boundaries. You got to set some boundaries of when you are available and when you are accessible. You could still be available when you can be accessible, but that doesn't mean you are available 365 days a year. It could be your daughter's wedding. What if they hit you up and they say, hey man, you got a minute? Like, no, I do not. I'm at my daughter's wedding. How's that different? I mean, look, it's the same thing in your business. So I've seen leaders hide. I've seen them actually hide so that someone won't even ask them those questions. Like they literally hide in their office, right? They close the door, they you know, turn down the blinds. You know, they make it seem like they're not even there. Look, man, you ain't got to do anything silly like that. You ain't got to be hiding in your own office, in your own business, like a bitch. Instead, you can just set aside time where you are available and accessible. Or if you've got standing meetings with people, you could say, hey, no problem. We meet every week. Why don't you bring that to that meeting? But most of the time, people will figure it out on their own. They sure will. We learned that. Another one. So my firm has grown from a team of 10 to a team of 50. Many of my OG members are still at the firm and have grown accustomed to communicating with me and meeting with me regularly. But as more layers of management have been put in place, they should not be reaching out to me directly for help with certain things. I like these people and genuinely want to be available to them, but I need to focus my time and attention on higher level and more impactful things. How do I do this? Change is, you know, sometimes we all go through evolutions in the business and there's what it looked like when you started your law firm and these people were sitting around the kitchen table with you to today. Now it seems like you've got many more people and many more layers of management to where you realize that clearly you can't manage all these people on your own. I mean, who can? It's impossible. If you got more than what, like seven, eight direct reports, how is it possible to manage that many people all at once, right? So how you put managers in place. Great idea, by the way. You know, managers and middle managers. But these OGs, these original gangsters, they don't like going to those managers because they remember sitting around the kitchen table with you. Yep. And they're like, I don't want to listen to this person. I'm going to go straight to Michael. I've been through it, my friends. So here's the thing. If the managers are set up correctly, and if they are brought in with the batteries included and they can be effective, well, then you know that they can provide direction to the team members that they lead. So first and foremost, you got to make sure that the managers are competent and effective and are capable, right? Because you want to make sure that your team members aren't coming to you because they want to you know, circumvent these other people because they're not getting the answers that they need. You want to make sure that their answers, they could get the answers from the, the people that they're reporting to. But the other aspect of it is, is let's just say, you know, in, in most cases, they just want to go to you. Because you're the buddy. They had known you from the beginning. And they don't want to go through another layer. Since when? So I think the uh, best thing here is set those rules of engagement. And realizing that, look, you want to be accessible to them? No problem. Take them to breakfast. Take them to lunch if you want to. Every once in a while. Not a problem. But this is the new regime. And in order for us to grow as a business, I can't answer every single one of your questions. And I can't be accessible to all 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 plus people in the organization 24-7. But that's why, with my judgment, we brought in these incredible leaders. They're here to help you and support you. Where I could not, they can, right? And it's realizing as a growing organization that this is, you know, this is how we're actually going to help one another. This is how we're going to be able to grow and scale. Now, one of two things is going to happen. Now, either these individuals will adapt to this new regime, or they will kick and scream and resist, at which point you will have to have a come-to-God conversation, we have to explain to them that the reality of it is, is this is how the organization is moving forward. And you can either stay in joy or leave in peace. And they will either fall in line or you will free up their future. But the reality of it is, as a growing leader, you have to realize that things can't always be the same in a growing organization as they were at the very beginning. 
I mean, it's just the complexity of it. Before, I remember when we were in our first office, we all sat in the same room together, in the exact same room together. I was sitting there with the editors. I was sitting there with marketing. Like, I mean, there was only like six or seven of us every single day. Of course, we all worked next to one another. I mean, that's impossible with a 140 person organization. There's all sorts of things we used to do, you know, when we were six people that we can't do with a hundred plus people today. That doesn't mean it's worse. It just means that it's different. I might get in a little trouble for this, but so be it. So I was invited into a Facebook group with my old high school and we're coming up on our 20 year high school reunion, which may not be a lot to some of you, but I look back and I say, wow, 20 years flew by. In this high school like reunion group, they're constantly posting pictures from you know, the years in which we graduated high school, like when we were there. Pictures of the football team, pictures of pep rallies, and they're all commenting and jiving. I'm thinking, look, guys, don't get me wrong. That was a great time, but we moved on. We have like great times now. I don't want to reflect back on my past, right? Like the, what's the least evolved conversation two human beings can have? Remember when? So instead of looking backwards, let's, let's look forward. You don't want to have your best days behind you. And it's the same thing in an organization. Yes, you may have nostalgia for what the good old days were like, but maybe the good old days are now. And maybe the good old days are what's, what's ahead. So it's reframing that, yes, things change, but change is not always a bad thing. Change is an evolution. How we used to do things that, you know, when we were under a million is different than when we were at 10 million, is different when we were 50 million, et cetera. Of course, it's going to be different. That doesn't mean it's worse. In many ways, like, guess what, guys? We didn't have health insurance back then, okay? You didn't have health, vision, dental back then. We didn't have our 401k match back then. We didn't have an annual bonus plan, but you know, back then, like we weren't giving away cars to our team members back then. Right. So yes, things have changed, but we're going to have many more good times. So I think that's really what it comes down to. And I think it starts with you as the leader, recognizing that, you know, you got to let go of your own guilt, that things are going to be a little bit different. And different isn't always bad. No, I would actually add a couple things. If they're the right OG people, like I actually do this still myself and I just meet with them once a month. Just like you said, maybe take them to a breakfast or a lunch, whatever. And it's like, you're still in my life. I'm still in your life. Here we are. And then the other side of that is if you allow the bypass, you are totally undermining the leaders that you put in place. It's true. I learned that lesson the very hard way right after we had Mila and I was trying to delegate things and people still come to me and it's the fastest thing to say like, yeah, this is approved. I'll order that. I'll do whatever. Our finance person comes to me and she's like, Jessica, I can't do my job. You're not letting me do my job. That's right. So- it's part of the change. Well said, Jessica. All right. Last one here. One of my department heads has worked really hard to propose a great idea for an operational improvement to streamline our case management process, but we're already overhauling another system in her department. I know that if we implement her idea, it will be at the detriment of our existing initiative. How do you handle situations where saying no may involve disappointing or rejecting members of your own team? Hmm. What's the next saving quote? If you want to make everybody happy... Go and sell ice cream. Yep. And if you want to be a leader, get used to saying no. No is focus. No is not a bad thing. In fact, the more things you say no to, typically the more focused you are. And that means that you're more dialed in. But in this instance, let's say you've got a team member who's working on something. They're very excited to present it to you. Yes, it can benefit the business. But if you do that versus something else right now, it's going to detract from another initiative. Okay. Sometimes no means not right now. Sometimes no means no in Q2 and yes in Q3. So, I mean, that can solve it, but sometimes no means no, just straight up. We're not going to do it, but I, you don't understand. How could this be? Well, context is important. So you can provide some context as to why, and someone can understand that. Like somebody asked me the other day, they're like, why don't we extend this service offering for our clients? Right. One of our team members just like me, I think it's awesome that they're, they're asking that question. They're like, you know, this is something that a lot of people ask about and like, no one seems to do really well. And I know we could do it well. Why don't we do it? And my answer was, is like, okay, since you asked, I will absolutely tell you, I do not believe that service offering will exist in the future. I just don't believe it's the future. And I believe that those that do it are living in the past. I think that with what we've got going on with AI and like where, you know, how technology is evolving, I think that just basically human decision-making and dynamics will render that type of service irrelevant. So I don't want to implement, you know, to me, it's not innovation when you're chasing the past. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. I thought we just weren't doing it because we didn't want to do it. I was like, no, I think we look at things through the lens of, is this going to make sense 10 years from now? So I think when you provide somebody context, I mean, at the same time, I had people bring me, you know, amazing initiatives that they were working on that unfortunately just didn't fit into our roadmap, you know, and sometimes didn't fit into our roadmap that entire year. 
And I appreciate someone taking the time to be proactive and, and, and work on something. Sometimes they bring it to you and it's amazing. And we say yes, and we dedicate resources to it. But it's ultimately understanding, like, we need to be able to make a business case for this. Where do we prioritize this? And, you know, in line with the other, you know, initiatives that we've got going on. And I think if somebody is curious, you can, you can absolutely provide them with that context and the why behind it. Because if they can see, like, if, you're, if they're just hearing no, and it's because I said so, well, people generally don't like that, right? Neither adults nor children. But if you can explain to them why, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to like it, but at least you can help them understand. And you can say, here's all the projects that we've got going on. This is where we're prioritizing things. This is how much time and resources is required of each one. And this thing that you proposed to me, well, great, this doesn't make sense in line of these other projects, which are higher priority for these reasons. Okay, well, I understand that. You know, and it could fit in here, maybe next year in Q2. Yeah, I mean, that's how we operationally tell you no is when you have a million ideas, we say, well, what's going to come off if you want to add this? Correct. So giving context and reason behind it. Correct. So I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing. And get used to saying no, because if you, if you say yes to everyone, you know who ultimately pays the price for that? You do. You and your family. and Ultimately, and then your team. And, and then, then your, your clients. team. And then your clients. And then your community. And then everyone around you. So typically, I'll give you my foolproof bulletproof, pre- premium, prestige, exclusive framework for how to decide whether to say yes or whether to say no. Can't wait to hear this. You ready for this? If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. That's it. That's it. See you next time. All right. See ya. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with Michael Mogul. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that we can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of Michael's book absolutely free at gamechangingattorney.com. Number two, you can shoot Michael a text at 404-531-7691 and ask him any question you'd like. You might just hear the answer on the next episode. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it will help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on this episode, see the show notes in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com.